So Exodus chapter 20, if you got it, say amen. amen. If you need a minute, say give me a minute. Sweet, let's stand as we read God's word. That's what we do here to honor his word. <coughs> as we uh, stand upon the right. So starting at verse 1. Then God spoke. Say, God spoke. God spoke. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have other gods besides me. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow and worship to them and do not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Punishing the children for the father's iniquity to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You are to labor six days and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock or the resident alien who is within your city gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may have a long life in the land that the Lord your God has given you. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony against your neighbor, do not covet your neighbor's house, do not covet your neighbor's wife, his male or female servant, his ox or his donkey, and anything that belongs to your neighbor. My sermon title today is called, There's Only Ten. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. And we praise you, Father. We praise you, God, that we get to worship you in this place. We praise you, God, that you are already working in our lives and encouraging us uh, and, and challenging us. Father, I pray, God, that you would just speak deep into us. So, Father, open up our eyes so that we can see your uh, word more clearly. Open up our ears so we can hear your word more clearly. And open up our hearts so we can feel your word more clearly. God, we're ready, and we need you. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn to three people and say, there's only ten. There's only ten. There's only ten. There's only ten. <laughs> you may be seated. We are in the middle of our series. We're coming, we only got three more weeks of this series. Um, and so our series that we're in is called Taking Back Our Territory. And what we were talking about, the Lord was telling us, as living water, that we need to learn how to pray harder. That we need to learn how to focus harder, worship harder, and witness harder. And today we're going to be focusing on the preaching harder. So if we look at the word preach, it means this. To preach is to declare what God has to say to his people and to exhort them to act on that by believing and obeying. Biblical preaching confronts us with God through the word, inspired by the Holy Spirit, through the personality of a preacher, and his personality is pretty sweet, um, so we will understand and respond to God. Now listen to what Paul says to Timothy about this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. He says, preach the word. Say, preach the word. Preach the word. If we look at the word preach, Preaching the word includes reading the word. Say read the word. Read the word. Explaining the word. Say explain the word. Explain the Declaring word. Declaring the word. Say declare the word. Declare the word. And applying it. Say apply it. Apply. Right? So he says you need to preach the word. So he's saying, Timothy, listen, I need you to start reading the word. I need you to start explaining the word. I need you to start declaring the word. And I need you to start applying it into your life. And then he says, but be ready. Say be ready. It says, be ready in season and out of season. Rebuke, correct, and encourage with great patience and teaching. He says, listen, Timothy, he says, I need you to be ready. You need to be ready. I need you to be ready in season and out of season. You see, right now, we live in a world that claims everything is relative. 
And people want to be able to hear the absolute truth of the Word of God preached in the church of the living God. Amen? Amen. 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 So, people ought to be able to hear the absolute truth of the word of God preached in the church of the living God. Amen? Amen. That's what I'm talking about. So this means that we are going to have to rebuke those things that are not true. We're going to have to correct those things that need to be corrected. And we're going to have to encourage with great patience and teaching. Now listen, each person might have his or her own view. But when we come to church, we need to hear God's view. Right? So the centerpiece of God's covenant with Israel is what we call the Ten Commandments. They reflect and they reveal God's righteousness. So let's jump into verses 1 through 2. Check this out. Let's put it up here on the screen. It says, then God spoke. Say, then God spoke. Then God spoke. No, no, no. Say, then God spoke. Then God spoke. So then God spoke all these words. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Now, Israel is about to enter into a covenant relationship with God, of, uh, with the Creator God of heavens and earth, because of what He had done for them. So I believe that when God speaks, then God spoke all these words. I believe that when God speaks, we have to listen. Don't you agree? Yeah, yeah we have to listen. So He's reminding Israel just who He is. He says, I am the Lord, your God, who delivered you out of the hands of Egypt. See, they were set free. They, are no long, they no longer have the identity of slavery on them. And the Lord is about to drop some knowledge. He's about to drop some rules. He's about to drop some expectations for the people of Israel to follow and to obey. And this is still a principle in work today in the New Testament era. We see that, it's, I'm not going to have it on the screen, but 2 Corinthians 5.15, we see that under the new covenant that Christ died so that those who trust Him might no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. Listen, the believer's motivation, our motivation, those who are followers of Jesus Christ, our motivation for obeying God's law is not to earn salvation because we can't. That's right? Right? We obey because we want to please the one who delivered us from, the, from hell and judgment. Amen? Amen? So there is so much, there is so much information on each commandment that there is no way that I can give you any great detail on each commandment. There's just too much for me to just teach it all in one Sunday. So I'm going to only scratch the surface today. Like a scratch and sniff sticker. You remember those things? How many of you remember those things, right? Oh, man. Why did they ever make the black licorice? I don't know. I didn't like that, right? But man, uh, when we were growing up, and just, oh, this is the greatest thing. It's cherry, so good, right? And that's what I'm hoping to do today, is just scratch the surface of each commandment today. But three weeks from now, say three weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks from now, we're going to start a new series called There's Only Ten. And we're going to break down each commandment uh, and go into it deeper and, and further, right? Because I think it's important that we're doing it, so you're not going to want to miss out. So those of you who are visiting, you better come back. It's going to be good. Say there's only ten. There's only ten. All right, so how many of you have ever seen David Letterman? Anybody seen David Letterman? Right, he's got the David Letterman top ten. You ever seen those things? Come on, you went to church? Right? How many of you watch TV? Yes. Nobody. How many of you got four TVs in your house with only one bedroom? Right, come on, right? So one of the top ten uh, things that I found was this. There was a Napoleon Dynamite top ten sign. You are not the most popular guy in high school. You guys know Napoleon Dynamite? Yeah. Okay. Number 10, right? This is from the David Letterman thing. Number 10. Okay. 
Napoleon Dynamite, top 10 side, you're not the most popular guy in high school. Number 10, your yearbook photo caption reads, unidentified sophomore. <laughs> Number nine, your only friend is the one who is the one you built in shop class. Number eight, the school song includes the phrase, how much you stink at things. Number seven, every time you talk to a girl, the conversation inevitably drifts to your frequent nosebleeds. Number six. You guys are making it sound like this is rough, right? Yeah. Top ten signs you're not the most popular guy in high school. Some of you are like, oh, that's me. That's what I love me, right? So check this out. Number six. The stupid kid who gets his tater tots stolen every day, he steals your tater tots. Okay? Number five. Everyone is jealous of your tetherball skills. Number four, not only did you take your mom to prom, but you had to pay her 20 bucks. <laughs> number three, number three, you can't dance like Napoleon Dynamite. Number two, Lord of the Rings figurines, 50. Friends, zero. Okay? Well, that's number one, top 10 signs you're not the most popular guy in high school. How the heck would I know I'm the coolest kid in school? That's the top 10 right there, right? Awesome. So which brings us down to the top 10 commandments that God has laid out for us here uh, in the 10 commandments. Let's check this out. Let's put it on the screen. Exodus 20, verse 3, it says this. Do not have other gods besides me. This rule means this. This rule means that you are to treat no other person, no other place, or thing in your life like God. He is not to be your chief God. He is to be your only God. That's who he is supposed to be. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 4.10. He says this. He says, then Jesus told him, go away, Satan, right? Because this is what Satan is messing around with him. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. We are to worship God and serve him only. Let me ask you this question. What... Or who has your attention, or what or who have you put in front of God in your life right now? What has your attention the most? Now I want you to notice that this is the first commandment. You shall have no other God besides me. You can't get this wrong, you can't get this one wrong, and expect to proceed in the other nine with success. If there's anything, if there's ever anything in your life other than God that you look to or you depend on as your source of well-being or satisfaction or deliverance, then you are serving another God. So God, uh, to get this commandment one wrong, if you get the commandment one wrong, you will fail at obeying the rest. I sat down with the church a while ago that found itself struggling. It found itself struggling and every time that a situation would come up or a problem would rise up, the leadership would actually sit down with each other and they would go over what their constitution would have to say about this situation, about this, this problem. You see, some churches' constitutions, all they are is a copy of Robert's Rules of Order. That's all they are. And when this leadership found problems or found themselves in these circumstances, they would actually run to Robert's Rules of Orders first before spending time in prayer and reading God's Word. And if a church decides to run to see what Robert has to say instead of what the Creator of Heaven and Earth has to say, that church is in trouble. It is in a lot of trouble. And you see what happened was, is that this church that I was sitting with, this church that I was counseling with, this church that I was speaking into their life, what I was telling them then, that, that the Robert rules of order had become their God. Because what happened was, is that they were putting their constitution before the Word of God. When it should have been this. When it should have been throw these, but you shouldn't, right? Everything should come out of God's Word. You need answers? 
God's Word. You need direction? God's Word. You need life? God's Word. You need gas for your car? God's Word. It's in there. I'm telling you, it's in there. Right? I'm telling you. Search God out. And what was happening was the Constitution became this church's God. And God said, you shouldn't have any other gods besides me. He said, there's only ten. Let's look at verse 4 through 6. He says, do not make an idol for yourself. If you're, God, if you're following me, underline that. Do not make an idol for yourself. Then God breaks it down. Whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above, or on the earth below, or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow and worship to them. And do not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for their father's iniquity, to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations for those, excuse me, who love me and keep my commands. I don't know. What's an idol? It's not American idol, but sometimes we make an American idol our idol, don't we? Come on, church. Yes, I told you, I love when you talk to me, okay? Right, so idol means this. An image or representation of a God used as an object of worship. So if we go to an idol, we're looking to something other than God. Idols, no matter the physical form that they take, can never connect heaven with earth, and they can never offer anything. Buddha. Buddha has an idol. Buddha has an idol. And listen, let me tell you something. If you have a figurine, or if you have a little Buddha, or whatever, and you're just rubbing his belly, can I tell you something? You're just polishing that thing. That's all you're doing. If you got a Buddha, a Buddha you're just making it smooth. That's all you're doing. If you got one made out of bronze, you're just polishing it up. Doing just that. That's all you're doing. You're just rubbing his belly, right? That's all it is, right? And can I tell you something? That wooden Buddha is going to do absolutely nothing for you. It's not going to do anything for you, right? These false idols, all they do is arouse God's jealousy. That's it. Listen, however, jealousy in God is not sinful. It's not sinful. Here's the reason why. I want you to think of it as this. Right? So think of it as a righteous and loving jealousy of a husband who is zealous for the faithfulness of his wife. He wants to keep her in their marriage from harm. Yes. Don't mess around with idols. And you saw number two, right? You should have no other idols before me. And he broke it down. It doesn't matter if it comes by land, sea, or air. You better not make anything. Ask King Nebuchadnezzar about that. See how that went for it, right? We have all these things that we put in front of us that we worship, that we that we uh, that we idolize, and we should. Listen to what Jesus says about it in Luke 16, 13. No servant can serve two masters. You agree? Yes. Since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You can't serve two masters. Say there's only ten. I told you, I'm only scratching the surface. <laughs> Wait for three weeks. You're going to have to put your seatbelts on. Right? Now, verse 7 says, Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. Now, in the Bible, a person's name is a reflection of who he is. Right? It speaks of his character. It speaks of his reputation. And God is rightly concerned about the glory of his name. He does not want it defamed or abused, but valued and honored. We are not to use uh, his name uh, casually. We're not to use his name carelessly, but seriously and reverently. And too often, however, we, we use frivolous phrases like, Thank God, or I swear to God. And at its core, this kind of flippancy is treating God's name insignificantly. Yeah. And it's saying that He is insignificant. You know what I can't stand? I can't stand when I hear people say, Oh my God. Or they'll say, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Right? Why do people do that? Why do Christians do that? Here's the thing, it drives me crazy. I don't understand. How come, how come Jesus 
Christ is a cuss word. How come you don't hear anybody else say, Oh, Muhammad! Right? How come we don't hear, Oh, Buddha! Oh, Joseph Smith! Right? When they're swearing, why do we hear that? Why do people honor them? Why do people say that that's, that's something you just shouldn't do? So why is Jesus' name a swear word? I don't get it. <laughs> one time I was, so I was in the military and I was walking into my office one time. So I was a guy, I was a, I was a guy who loaded bombs and missiles on the F-16, okay? So I came walking into, the, into our, our weapons uh, thing. And as I walked in, someone said, Jesus Christ, right? They were in the middle of the sentence and they just said, Jesus Christ. And I said, nope, Jason King. <laughs> that's, right. that's, that's, that's me, right? I wanted to make sure that we deflected, right? They don't be taking the Lord's name in the Lord's name in vain, right? Listen. So here's the thing: instead, instead of saying "Oh my God," or instead of texting "OMG," I want you to do something. I'd rather you use my name, okay? I want you to use my name and leave the Lord's name out. Of it. So next time something happens, you say, "Oh my Jason," <laughs> "OMG." Oh, okay, this is what happened to me today, right? That actually kind of rhymes. Oh, and Jay happened to me today, right? That's what I want you to do. Do me a favor. Leave God's name out of it. Only use his name to honor and glorify him. Only use his name in reverence and in awe. That's how you should do it. I'm serious. The next time something happens, or you hear somebody do it, right? And when I hear someone say, oh, my God, I'm like, what did you just say? Whether you're my family member or not, I'll call you out. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Right? Matthew 5, 34 says this. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all. If you have some NIV, it says, don't swear uh, either by heaven, because it is God's throne, or by the earth, because uh, it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, because it is the city of the great king. You say there's only ten. Remember the Sabbath, right? Let's bring it up. And verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Then Jesus, our God, goes into detail about how we're supposed to do that. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. He says this. So here's how you do it. Here's how you're to keep the Sabbath day. And here's how you are to, well, remember the Sabbath day. And here's how you're to keep it holy. He says, you are to labor six days. Say six days. Six days. You are to labor six days and do all your work. I want that to sink in. You are to labor six days and do all your work in those six days. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Listen, this is God speaking to Moses. God saying to Moses, reveal this, re relay this to my people. Right? You heard in the beginning, he says, then God spoke these words. Okay. So the seventh day to the Lord your God. You must not do any work. Say any work. Any, any work. work. And then he starts pointing fingers. You, your son, your daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock, or the resident alien who is within your city gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them in six days. Say six days. Six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. The Lord God created uh, for six days and rested on the seventh day. He created everything, heaven and earth, day and night, sun and moon, stars, planets, places, plants, everything. Everybody take a deep breath. Blow it out. He created all the oxygen that you just breathed in. He actually created your lungs that breathe that in, the heart that pumps, right? Isn't it amazing that we live on planet Earth that is tilted at such an angle, that is spinning at such a speed, that we have gravity and, and, and oxygen, and that we are perfectly placed from the sun so we can have four seasons unless you live in Arizona, right? And that's just it. This is how it works, right? And so you get all those seasons. But right? praise God for seasons, right? Praise God for mosquitoes. Praise God for the duck billed platypus. Right? What's that all about? Thank God for a giraffe, right? Thank God for your spouse. Thank God for your neighbor. Thank God that we have trees that can build homes 
in, in, uh, in fences. Praise God that somehow there is some kind of organic material that formed into metal and now we have cars and we have planes. Planes that can fly. Can you believe that? <laughs> they are thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds. And they fly in the air or they float on the water. Right? God did that. You're probably like, I don't know. Somebody invented that. Right. God invented the material for the God to invent what had to happen. Right? It's all God. Say it's all God. It's all God. So in six yes. days, he created some amazing stuff. Would you agree? Yes. But clearly, the all-powerful God didn't rest on the seventh day because he was tired. No. He rested so he could enjoy what he did. Right, check it out. It's not on the screen, but in Genesis, right? After the sixth day, what did he do? He said, God saw all that he made, and it was very good. Right? After six days of work, on the seventh day, he sat back and he's like, well, that's very good. He didn't pat himself on the back like, oh, that No. He says, that is very good. After six days of work, we are also called to rest and to enjoy the fruit of our labor. God also made the Sabbath so that his people would be reminded of his sovereignty. Let me ask you this question, right? I just, am I talking to some real people here today? I hope so. Right? Am I speaking to some honest people here today? Yes. Yeah? How many of you feel like you never have any time to relax? Come on. How many of you feel like, man, there's not enough time in the day? There's not, I wish God created 25 hours instead of 25 hours, right? I wish that there were more hours, right? So in a, in a week, there's 168 hours a week, in a week, okay? 168, 168 hours. And we're saying, man, I don't have enough time just to sit back and relax. You know what? I do my best. I do my best to make Monday my day to do nothing. I, that's my day. It's my day to relax. And sometimes my Monday has to be a Tuesday. And sometimes my Tuesday or my Monday has to be a Friday. That's right. But I take a day to relax. I relax my mind. I relax my, my voice. I relax my physical body. Listen, on that day, I sleep in. I sleep in. On that day, I sit on the porch and all I do is listen. That's all I do. Whatever I, whatever I can do to relax on that day, that is what I need to do. It is a must that I take a day of Sabbath rest. It is what I do. Now some of you are saying, I don't have time to do that. Well, if you're saying you don't have time to do that, listen, that's your choice. You've decided to not have time for yourself. But I want you to know that if the Lord took a day, I think it's okay for you to take a day too. Amen. Right? I think it's okay. Did you create the heavens and the earth? No. He had a busier week than you did. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and I think that if you can sit back and relax, I think you can do that too. Oh, by the way, remember this. He said, keep it holy. Do you do it? Do you focus on him on that day? Listen to what Jesus says in Mark 2, 27 through 28. Then he told them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So then the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Say there's only ten. There's only ten. Verse 12. Honor your father and your mother so that you may have a long life in the land that the Lord your God has given you. To honor your parents means to respect and value them. Young children and teenagers living under their parents' authority are to obey them in all things, unless, of course, doing, uh, doing so dishonors God. Right? But adult children, too, who are no longer in their, under their uh, parents' or in their parents' home or under their authority still owe their parents honor. So this might show up in the form of spending time with them or praising their merits or providing physical and financial assistance. Listen, they did that for us. That's right. They did that for us. And even children whose parents have neglected or abandoned or abused them are called to honor them spiritually. 
by praying for them and forgiving them, just as God also forgave us. Amen. You know, when my father passed away, my dad was the only one who worked in the house. Now, my mom, she became a parent um, about maybe a couple months before my dad passed away. That was her first job ever. Unless you consider selling Avon when we were growing up and riding in the cars. <laughs> <sighs> Don't get me started. <laughs> right? But that was her first job. And when my dad passed away, uh, and he passed away unexpectedly, uh, that was tough. And the thing was, is we were all wondering as a family, how's mom going to survive? How's she going to be able to handle the house payments? How's she going to be able to handle the car payments? You know, my dad just had a little money. And so uh, I remember my father saying to me before he passed away, because he had some kind of notion, he had some kind of clue. He said, Jason, listen, I want your mom to move in with you. Right? <laughs> and you know, and that's, that's Superman. When Superman tells you to do something, you do it. Right? And so for two years, uh, my dad's friend took care of my mom's mortgage. And in those two years, we were able to get ourselves situated to where my mom could move in. And my mom did move in. Uh, we moved into a brand new house. We got her, uh, her own little suite with a uh, bedroom suite with her own bathroom and uh, you know, uh, bring in all your furniture, right? We made sure that we took care of my mom. We wanted to make sure that she was handled and taken care of, right? It was my turn as her oldest son, right? <laughs> but I believe I gave her chores. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> as I finally remember, we made me pick up all the dog food and get out there. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you think I'm kidding? <laughs> I am kidding. I did make a dig to trash out there. Right? So the trash is getting full, you better take it out. But turn about is fair play. That's how we're going to roll in this house. You know, make me follow your rules, you're going to follow under my rules. What? What's that? You better go to your room and think about that for a minute. <laughs> just kidding. That's not my favorite thing. Right? Just kidding. That's a joke. Grandma's here. My mom's monster. That, that did not happen. Okay? Not happen. She gave me the look like I'm going to go to my room. <laughs> which I look forward to. Right? And so, listen, we need to honor our father and our mother. We need to take care of it, don't we? Yes. Right? It's our turn. Yes. Right? We need to pray over them. We need to, to honor them, right? And so we need to step up and, and to move forward. Now my mom has now been remarried. Uh, she lives in Green. Uh, and so, you know, um, her husband's taking care of her now. But the thing is, is that uh, we need to take care of our parents. We need to honor them. Uh, and, and go from there. So, say there's only 10. There's only 10. Verse 13, right? I know that I feel... Do you feel like I'm kind of rushing through this a little bit? Because I do. And when I was putting this all together, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm leaving so much meat on the table. But listen, you're just getting the scratch and stiff sticker version right now. Okay? When you come back, and we're going to tear it. We're going to tear it down. Okay? So, uh, verse 13 says this, do not murder if you have never murdered, good on you, okay? Yeah. If you have never murdered, listen, it does not mean that you are in the clear. Listen, let me tell you why. Jesus explained that keeping this commandment is actually a minimum standard. This is what he says. To express or harbor unrighteous anger toward another person is not just sin, it's murder committed in the heart. Ooh, Matthew 5, 21 through 22, just listen. It says, you have heard it was, uh, it was said to your ancestors, but do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. Now this is Jesus speaking. But I tell you, everyone who is angry, say angry. angry. Anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. Whoever says you fool will be subject to hell fire. Whoever is angry, right, with the other sister, will be subject to judgment. Let me tell you something. God is the judgment. And, uh, whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. Guess what? God is the court. Okay? Whoever says, you fool, will be subject to hellfire. God is the only one who can sit you that. Right? There was, there was this, uh, I worked under this minister who was, he was tough. He was hard. He didn't have a kind thing to say about me, and he hired me as his youth 
guys will figure that out. Things got a little crazy in the church that we were serving in, and um, it got it just got bad. And so this pastor and his wife had stepped down. And I gotta understand that everything that was happening in that church was they were blaming me because of it. I'm just a youth. And I'm dealing with seventh through twelfth grade kids, man. I got my own issues. What are you talking about, right? And so here's the thing, but they would blame me. And they would point the finger at me. This is your fault. This is the reason why we have to leave, right? It's you, it's you, it's you. And I know it's not me. But it ate me up. It ate me up. And every time that I would think of those two people, I would see red. Come on, you got someone in your life? Every time you think about them, you see red? Some of you don't know because it says it's your sin. Come on, am I speaking to people, right? You know, you've heard me say you can, there are people in your life where you can hang out for four minutes but not five, right? You know there are people who come into your life and they're walking down the hallway, you walk the other way because you don't want to talk to them, right? You don't want to them to your house because you can't stand them or you, you just, you're just you just holding rage or bitterness toward them, right? That was me. I had that towards these two people. And here's the thing. I allowed them to live right free in my mind. I allowed them to live there. But then I let it go. And I forgave them. Because here's the thing. I needed Jesus to drive my cross and not them. That's right. So I guess the question I have for you is, who's living rent free in your mind right now? Mm -hmm. It's time to let it go. It's time to forgive them. Say, there's only 10. There's only 10. Verse 14. Well, you guys got quiet on that. <laughs> because you're just like, oh, man, I got to honor my parents and I got to Okay, right, verse 14, okay? Do not commit adultery. Say that out loud. God created sex as a wonderful blessing to be shared by a husband, listen to me, by a husband and wife within the boundaries of a marriage covenant. Well, I promise you I'm going to go deep into this one. Sex was intended to inaugurate and renew that covenant, that one flesh union, right, that we see in Genesis 2. Yes. Okay? So adultery is uh, sexual intercourse involving at least one married person, right? So adultery is defiling of that covenant bond that God uh, proclaimed in Genesis chapter 2. You also see it uh, also in Ephesians, okay? So I want you to think of it like this, okay? I want you to think of sex like a fire, with, with marriage serving as a living room fire place, okay? And if you allow sex to blaze outside of its intended boundary, you just might burn down your own home. So in any case, you will unleash destruction. Matthew 5, this is what Jesus says, 27 through 28. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you, Everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I believe that pornography is in this category. There are men, listen, I want you to listen to me closely. There are men and women addicted to pornography. Okay? I've actually heard uh, a couple say, a husband and a wife, say that they watch it together. All I'm going to tell you is that pornography destroys marriages. That's right. Because if you really think about it, if you are a person who watches pornography, you're actually watching someone else's daughter or son. How does that make you feel? Imagine if it was your child. So, stay clear of all these things. And if you're married, Maybe it's time to pay more attention to your spouse and be faithful to them. And if you're single, then you need to wait until you're married. That's right. Say, there's only 10. There's only 10. Verse 15, do not steal. To steal means this, is to take what belongs to someone else without the right uh, or permission to do so. 
We typically think of stealing in terms of pocketing money or making off with possessions, but theft can take a variety of forms. It can take the form of kidnapping, plagiarism, or accepting praise or credit that should have gone to another person, not paying taxes, or accepting a paycheck without earning it, and even withholding wages. Listen, theft also happens when we rob God by not contributing tithes. Check out Malachi 3, 8-10. I remember when I was a young boy, I'm confessing, right? I've got, uh, I've got the patriarch of my family or my grandma, so I'm confessing. When I was a young boy, I walked into a store and I stole one of those Hubba Bubba guns. You know what I'm talking about? The little round ones that you put in your mouth is like chewing on a rock. They're red with flavor. Flavor lasts 30 seconds. Stole one of those. While I'm in the store, it was actually an adrenaline rush for me. It was an adrenaline rush because I knew that if I got caught, I would be in huge trouble. I'm probably eight or nine. Now here's the question. As I look back on it now, why did I do that? Because that gun only cost a nickel. Only cost a nickel. That's stealing, isn't it? I remember I was reading an article. I was reading an article about this couple who lived in Georgia, and they were taking a walk in their neighborhood or downtown, small place. They had a five-year-old daughter who was following behind them. Their other kids were in front of them. As they were walking, they looked back, and their daughter was there. Walk maybe another 30 seconds, turned around, their daughter was gone. They couldn't find her. They searched for her. Couldn't find her anywhere. Someone had stolen their dog. At this time, as I'm reading this article, I lived in Las Vegas, Nevada. And that's when I became uh, very protective of my family. Very protective. Now, I don't know if you know about Las Vegas very much or walking down the strip, but at that time, we only had two kids. Let's just pause and think about that for just a moment. Close with the days. Because we have five kids, right? right? But we only had two. Those of you who had two kids, you got made, okay? Uh -huh. Got made. Don't come to me until you got six. Then we'll talk, all right? I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. But here's the thing. So our girls were little. So they're like five or six, two or three. And I remember walking down... Uh, Las Vegas Boulevard. Now, as you walk down Las Vegas Boulevard, they have these men who pass out these, like, nudie cards. Girls to your room, right? And they're handing them to my girls. What the hell? Cool. My youngest, uh, no, my oldest is on my shoulders, right? I'm carrying my youngest, and I make my wife put her finger in my belt loop. That's right. Here's the reason why. If someone takes my wife, I'm going to fill it. <laughs> then, as I'm walking down the strip, I walk like this to make some room. Every good running back on a football team has to have a good fullback. Right. I'm the fullback of my family. Yeah. Right? And I would plow through this road or plow through this strip. And people try to hand my little girls those little cards are like smack. Smack, right? Like, get them. <laughs> Don't make me put these kids in, I'll fight you. Right? And here's the thing. I'm so protective of my family. And sometimes it drives my kids nuts. I don't care. I don't care if it drives my kids up. My kids are adults now. My youngest is going to be turning 19 next month. Okay? And I still make them check in with me. I mean, I know you're 29. I know you got three kids on your own. But you better call. Right? I pray for them every day, every morning, every night. I'm just praying for them. Right? I, want, I don't want anybody messing with my family. And to quote my son Jacob, I would say, come at me, bro. Come at me, bro. Listen, my son Jacob right here in the front row, right? He says that a lot. He says, come at me, bro. You know why? It's not that he can take them down. He knows that his father can take them down. <laughs> listen, you know, listen, go, 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 go. You have, you have a situation in your life too, 
Right? And you feel like you can't take it down, but your Heavenly Father can take it down. So you look at your situation, you say, come at me, bro. And that situation has to bow down to your Heavenly Father. Yeah. So you have that authority, you have that power, right, in your life. Right? Sure. Got it. Okay. So, this is what Matthew 540 says this. As for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. Say, there's only ten. Do not give false testimony against your neighbor. You ever heard that phrase? Phrase, sticks and stones will break my bones. Your names will never hurt me. Bounces off of me, it sticks to you. I'm honey, you're good. Oh, the teachers go. may break my bones, but words can never hurt me, right? Words hurt, don't they? Man, they hurt. And many people have been emotionally scarred or have had their reputations damaged by careless or intentionally harmful words. Lies and slanderous accusations can even end off. There are some folks who would have given false testimony about me in the past, who has spoken untruthfully about me in my past, in the past. And guess what? Everybody experiences it, right? Yeah. We do. Right? These people would be tried, they would try to tear down my reputation, or they try to destroy my character, and when I met with them face to face, and, and knowing that they are doing it, and they know that they are saying it, when I'm face to face with them, all they do is this. Sorry. <laughs> I was asked one time, how do you handle these situations? How do you handle the situations when people are tearing your good name down, when people are tearing your, your, your reputation down, when people are coming and tearing your church down. How do you handle that situation? I say I don't. I don't handle that situation. You see, I let my character do all the talking for itself. The people who truly know me know that's not true. The people who truly know who living water is all about you know, that's not true. You see, I have a number one policy in my life. My number one policy is honesty. Say honesty. Honest. That's it. That's my number one policy. That's all I care about. As long as you're honest. If you're honest with me, I'm going to be honest with you. I am a walking, uh, you know everything about me. I'm so transparent that you can see right through me. I'm just honest about everything, right? I believe in integrity. Integrity means doing the right thing even when no one's looking. But I'm going to tell you something. Words can hurt. And friendships can be lost because I've lost some friends. But my character, it always stands strong. I guarantee you, come at me, bro. Right? <laughs> Matthew 12, 36 says this. I tell you that on one, uh, I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will have to account for every careless word they speak. This is the next line that I want you to listen to. For your words, for your words, you will be acquitted, and by your words, you will be condemned. Say, there's only ten. There's only ten. Seventeen, verse seventeen. Here you go. Do not come at your neighbor's house. Listen, he didn't stop there. Do not come at your neighbor's wife, his male or female servant his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Coveting is a passionate longing to possess something that is not yours. A covetous person is materialistic. He considers the physical more important than the spiritual, and assumes that his life consists in the abundance of possessions. He is never satisfied. And he fails to trust God to provide for him and assumes God is holding out on him. Okay, you don't need to respond to these 
questions. I want you to think about it. Have you ever said, I wish I had a house like this? Yeah. I wish I had a, wish I had a car like this. I wish I had a spouse like this. <laughs> oh, you know, he's it. <laughs> you better keep your eyes on the pastor at all times. <laughs> you ever said, I wish I had muscle like theirs? I wish I had a job like theirs? But have you ever thought that maybe someone is saying that about you? I was on a mission trip in Belize. In the jungles of Belize, I wasn't in the tourist seaside. I didn't get off of a boat. I got off of a plane, got into a hot van, drove an hour and a half into the jungle, got out, and here's what I saw. I saw people living in makeshift sheds. Sheds, not like a tough shed that you see uh, on the commercials, right? I'm talking about a shed made out of like the, the metal or wood pieces or what have you. Families living in it, in the size of a shed. Families of six kids and husband and wife, all staying in the size of maybe an eight by 12. Hammocks. I shared this story and I'll share it again. There was a family that was uh, we, we saw who were living in the side of a mountain. You can see in Belize, if you're a Belizean uh, uh, citizen, you get land up to five acres, and this is just jungle. And they have to go in there and tear down trees and, and build. So they built off the, they cut into the mountain, and they built their little home. Their kitchens are on the outside. On the inside were two hammocks, and the hammocks is where mom and dad slept. On the floor were welcome mats, right? And welcome mats is where the little girls slept. Right, maybe five, three, there was two of them. And here's the thing, when it would rain, and man would it rain. When it rained, the mud would come into the home. And they would be up into ankle deep, like ankle deep mud. The little girls are sleeping on them. And the kids, the teenagers that we took in with them, and we, we decided to take our fun money and build beds for them so they could be off, off the floor. Off the floor. Listen. We don't have it that bad. But there are people who live in Cheyenne, well, how many of you have a roof over there? See, we always want more than what we truly need, right? Luke 12, 15 says this. He then told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed, because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Then God spoke these words. <laughs> the Israelites were only three months into their exodus of Egypt when Moses brought the commandments down. And God only gave them ten. He probably could have gave them a hundred, right? But we're only going to remember ten because we remember that's what David Letterman taught. It's hard to obey all ten, isn't it? Yes. Come on, it's hard to obey one, yes. right? But you know what I think is really cool about this is that God created you fearfully and wonderfully. He made you beautiful. Inside and out. He wants what's best for you. Jeremiah says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Right? Listen to those three words. Declares the Lord. Those are the only three words that I love about that verse. Right? I have plans for you, declares the Lord. Plans to give you a hope in the future. Not to help you. Uh, uh, to help you, not to harm you. Give you hope in the future. Declares the Lord. If God is declaring that over your life, then why can't we receive it? Why can't we receive it? Because I'm not good enough. Because I 
have an idol in my life? Is it because I'm covenant uh, my neighbor's house? Is it because I stole something? Is it because uh, I've committed adultery? Is that a problem? Because I don't keep the Sabbath. <laughs> Probably some of you are thinking, why is he pouring this all down on me? He's just making me feel worse. No, I'm not making you feel worse. I'm telling you something. Jesus set me free. Amen. And when you walk in the freedom of Jesus, these, these commandments, these expectations, <coughs> man, they are on the forefront of your mind. They are on the front burner of your mind. I promise you, I'm going to mess up every day. There was a time in my life where I was going to, I said, I'm, I'm not going to sin all day long. I would be weird, right? Uh -huh. I'm serious. I, I thought that. I was doing good. <laughs> I was doing good. I was taking my kids to school. And I thought I was maybe an hour and a half into it. I thought I was doing really good. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh my gosh. And then your thought hit my mind. I was like, no! Start over. That was 10, 15 years ago. Guess what? I fail every day. Every day. You want to know the secret? Because I got Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for me. He gave me a new identity. And all my sins and all my failures and everything that had happened to me died on that cross. The price was paid on that cross. And I thank God for that every day. And so I strive to obey. I strive to obey. I won't have any other gods before me or before him. I will not make any idols whatsoever. None. Sometimes this is our idol. Put it down. What did we do before cell phones? Paper. Paper. Mail, right? That's right. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. And He didn't come into the world to condemn the world, He came into the world to save it. You're sitting in this room right now, and I don't know if you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I don't know. Maybe some of you have been sitting in, in a room like this all your life, and you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. You never, in your heart, believe that you that Jesus was the Lord and Savior of your life. Well, you've gone through the motions and you've done everything you were supposed to do, but you didn't really do it right. And I just did it because I wanted people to be excited about me, but I go home and live for me. And the ultimate price was paid on the cross. And Jesus says this in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Listen, you can't get to heaven any other way except through Jesus Christ. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. And Romans says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and because you believe in your heart, you shall be saved. I paraphrase it. Some of you are in here today carrying a lot of weight. Carrying a lot of weight. And the Lord wants to take that from you. Because you already paid the price for it. <laughs> and if we give our life to Christ, all those situations, all those circumstances, all the things that are happening in your life, they have to bow. They have to bow to Jesus. I'm wondering if you're ready to just let it go. Everybody hold up your hands for believe in this. There's only ten. 